Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not going to refer to the weather, though I just have. Uh, uh, so um, you are most welcome. Thank you for coming. If anybody, uh, I'm looking around, I can't see any unfamiliar faces. But if anybody is new to the church, you're particularly welcome. And uh, Dan Button, uh, our guest speaker today, is very, very, very welcome. Um, thank you, Dan, for coming. And Mike and Mandy, it's always terrific to have you here. We're grateful to you. So uh, let's begin with a brief prayer. Father, we, we've come to meet uh, with you, to be in your presence in a, in a special way, the way that we can be as your people together. Uh, we pray that your spirit may be active amongst us uh, in our hearts and in our midst um, so that we may worship in spirit and in truth and we may hear what you have to say to us and you may inspire Dan as he uh, speaks to us and we just commit this whole service to you we thank you again that you've called us together uh, and bless your name uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn, and the hymns are fairly traditional hymns uh, this morning, that reflects uh, your traditional leader. Um, our opening hymn is uh, The God of Abraham Praise. And uh, it's on the screen, the God of Abraham prays, and we'll stand to sing if we can, but please don't mind if you need to sit down.
Thank you for that. Now, I, I'm going to interview Dan. Dan, if you come and join me. I know he has sort of given a little intro on the screen, didn't you, in the, yes. <laughs> uh, previously? You remember that uh, Dan was going to come, he himself, in person. Um, about the time we were concentrating on climate issues because of COP26. But then Dan was whisked away to COP26 for higher things, um, and uh, we, we missed out on that. So I thought it'd be nice if we uh, just got to know him even better this morning. Dan, um, I, I detect from your um, accent <laughs> that you're not necessarily from Gloucester. Uh, you're from the States. Yes. Initially. Uh, is that still important to you? Um, well, yes. I'm from Minnesota, which is right up on the border with Canada. And it's not really relevant, apart from uh, that you will notice my accent, and people are always curious where it's from, because it's not really American. It's, um, most people do guess Canada rather than America. Oh, but uh, it's sort of mid-Atlantic, because I've left <laughs> the U.S. about 25 years ago. My wife and I moved on to Africa and then moved back here. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Africa. Uh, that's uh, important in, in your history? <laughs> Absolutely. We were called into mission work, and we were both um, teaching theology, and we, we worked in uh, Zambia, in Kenya, and then after we got married, went straight to Zimbabwe for a number of years, and then ended our time with eight years teaching at Uganda Christian University. So that's where our children were born and grew up. We have very, very fond memories of our time in Africa. Yeah. My goodness. So what brought you to little old Gloucester? <laughs> Well, my wife is British, and she won the battle of where we would come back to live, which country we would live in after Africa. In fact, there was no battle. She said, we're going to England. That's that. <laughs> um, why Gloucester? Well, it was really because of Redcliffe College. And so Jonathan and I were colleagues there for, uh, for a number of years. Um, and he, here we still are. Great. We, uh, we had good fellowship in Gloucester. Dan and I uh, disagreed. Most of the time, <laughs> but, but remain good friends, didn't we, Dan? Yes, absolutely. Is that a fair, fair, summary? That's a fair summary? a fair summary. Yeah, summary. Yeah. Um, something to do with the uh, Iraq War, I remember. Never mind, oh, let's yeah. not go back. Let's not go back to that, okay. Um, okay, so it was Redcliffe College, uh, but Redcliffe College, sadly, is... Uh, no more. Is that, that's right. Well, it? it still exists, but it has merged with All Nations College. So all the facilities are no longer in Gloucester, but everything's moved to All Nations, and the Redcliffe staff are now teaching sort of uh, online, uh, virtually, as All Nations has, has moved that way because of COVID. I think my friend's daughter goes to school in the same building. Oh. That's um, Hannah. Matthew Tasha's Yes, so yes. It's Oh yeah, yeah, the old building, yeah, it's yeah. definitely, yes, it's a, it's now an international school. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yes. It is. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, uh, we were in that building on Horton Road, which probably is familiar to many of you, yeah. which is now an international school, and uh, being put to good use, I gather. Mm -hmm. Good. Dan, so what, what now? I mean, mm -hmm. are you still teaching, you're not teaching at Redcliffe. No, I'm not. My wife is still at Redcliffe, but I left Redcliffe about five years ago, and I launched something new, which was quite uh, not, uh, you know, something quite scary for me to do, because that's not my, my nature to just launch into a new idea, but I felt that this was what the Lord was telling me to do. So I started something called Gateway Theology School, or GTS, and it's a way of bringing biblical and theological engagement out of the academic preserve where I'd spent my whole career and back into the hands of all God's people. So, uh, so I bring uh, biblical theological discussion and engagement into churches all around the area. So, Because uh, I, I really believe that theology is for everyone. It's, it's not supposed to be the preserve of academics and scholars. It's something that all of us should be doing together as Christians. And how's it going? It's going well, yeah. I've, I've got, uh, got two or three courses uh, going right now. Some other people are teaching uh, Hebrew, and I'm teaching one on, on uh, uh, explorations in faith and theology. Someone else is teaching one on ethics. 
two more coming up in Lent. So yeah, but it's, it's always a challenge to keep things going and, and always uh, have something uh, ahead of, of, of the ending of the next one. Charlie wants to know what, uh, like, other people can't hear you, Charlie, so I'm relaying your question. Mm-hmm. Charlie wants to know what theology means or, or what the, what, where the word comes from. That is a great question because th- for many people, theology is a scary word. It's one of those ology words, you know, like anthropology and psychology and all the other ologies. It's nothing to do with me. I don't do those ology words. But actually, theology simply means... Well, in its basic form, theos, the theo part, is God. And and so, yeah, that's the Greek, yes. Yeah, ancient Greek. Because a lot of our English words come from come from Greek and come from Latin, so it's it's just the nature of languages. Yes, yes. So our scriptures come from Greek and Hebrew, but theology is actually how we think. So it's how we, as Christians, think about God is not studying God as though he's, he's an object to be studied, but God exists in relationship with his world and in relationship with us. So as we think about God, we are thinking about God in relationship to ourselves, our lives, the world, and everything in relation to him. And, and so it's like, it's like philosophy only in relation to God, but it's, you know, it, it's discussing Uh, contemporary issues, discussing uh, the kingdom of God, discussing family, work, life, everything. That is theology. Thank you very much, Dan. That's, uh, as usual, thoroughly lucid explanation of everything. (laughs) Good. Uh, We'll sing now a couple of worship uh, songs. one after the other, without my reintroducing the se- uh, introducing the second one, um, Light of the World and Lord, You Have My Heart. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Oh, 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 oh,
Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Oh, Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice. As you know, we've, we're in the middle of a series uh, about uh, people whom Jesus met. And I wonder whether anybody can remember who the first person we talked about in our series. Peter, Peter good. Uh, yes, and the second? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And the third? Samaritan. The woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Okay, and today... We have the fourth in our series, which we're looking at the rich young ruler, as he's often called. Um, and we're going to have the appropriate reading for that from Marion. Thank you, Marion. And after that, Dan, you can come up. The reading this morning is taken from Mark 10, verses 17 to 25. It's called The Rich Man. As Jesus was starting up on his way again, a man ran up to him, knelt before him and received him, asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to receive eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not, not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not accuse anyone falsely, do not cheat, respect your father and mother. Teacher, the man said, ever since I was young, I have obeyed all these commandments. Jesus looked straight at him with love and said, you need only one thing, Go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, gloom spread over his face and he went away sad because he was very rich. 
Jesus looked around at his disciples and said to them, How hard it will be for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were shocked at these words, but Jesus went on to say, My children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is much harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Amen. Well, thank you for your warm welcome back, even though last time I was only here virtually. It's great to be here in person. So as Jonathan said, you've been doing this series on people that Jesus met and how they responded. We might sum that up with the phrase, encountering Jesus. And that's a really important phrase for today. Because this week, we have a very unique and unusual story, one that doesn't fit easily with other familiar encounters people had with Jesus. And in fact, it's quite a disconcerting story, even disturbing to some. And I think that's partly because it's a very difficult story to interpret and understand, but also because the man who met Jesus went away sad and disappointed. We're used to people meeting Jesus and going away healed and changed, saved, forgiven, rejoicing, never the same again. Unless, of course, he's meeting the Pharisees or the Sadducees or teachers of the law who are always trying to trap him in his words and uh, give him difficult legal questions from the scriptures. They go away frustrated and angry, foiled again. And we enjoy how Jesus always gets the upper hand over his opponents. But this story is different because here's a man who truly and sincerely wanted to follow Jesus but went away disappointed. It's often called the story of the rich young ruler. Now, just as a point of interest, we know he was a young man from Matthew's gospel. We know he was a ruler from Luke's gospel. And we know he was rich from Mark's gospel. Well, actually, all three make that last point. When we compare the gospel accounts, we're actually putting the story together from three different perspectives. Matthew was a disciple, an eyewitness. Luke was a very careful historian. And Mark was a disciple of Peter. And he heard Peter preaching on these stories very dramatically. So each gives their own unique emphasis. And often we only get the full picture when we compare them. Although that often raises new questions as well. But that's why we call these synoptic gospels. So syn, S-Y-N, means together, and optic means seeing. So seeing together. Now, I only highlight this because this is one of those stories where each account gives a slightly different emphasis and different details, and that raises some interesting interpretational challenges. Now, part of my job as a theologian is biblical interpretation. There's a whole process to interpretation which goes beyond the simple, what does this mean to you? Which is a perfectly legitimate question. But it begins to ask, what, does, what did this mean to the people then? What did the original authors have in mind? And what would the original readers have understood by this? What did the story mean in its original context? Now, one of the best ways we can do interpretation is through understanding the context around the story. Now, context can include geographical, historical, chronological, literary, biblical context. And I don't think we can truly understand this story at all without digging at least a little way into its context. In fact, when I used to teach uh, biblical interpretation in Zimbabwe and Uganda, I really made a strong point of this, and we, we would say, context is king. And every week, as we were doing interpretation, I would reinforce it by, by saying, everyone repeat after me, context is king. So why don't we do that now? Let everybody repeat together. Context is king. If, if you can wait to the end, we'll have, we'll have some questions. It, Well, context is everything around. Just think of, of the term around. So the, the geography, the background, the history, everything around the story. So in Zimbabwe, 
when I was doing this, I did that every week and they'd all repeat, context is king. And at the end of term, I set them an exam. And I thought, hmm, this is a tough exam. I'm going to give them a really easy bonus question at the end. So I said, blank is king. You get a free bonus point for that. Blank is king. And when I got the exams back, half of them had written context is king. Guess what the other half had written? Jesus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jesus is king. Well, I couldn't really mark them wrong, could I? So I had to give them all credit. But in, in biblical interpretation, at least, context is king. So before we do a quick tour of the context of this story, I want to say clearly what it's not about. And that's because I've often heard it preached this way. It's not saying that Christians should sell their possessions and live a simple lifestyle in order to be followers of Jesus. I know it might sound like that, but that's a very simplistic interpretation. There's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. Now we know that Jesus encountered an extraordinarily wide range of different people in his ministry. And this was intentional. He spoke to Romans, Greeks, Jews, Samaritans, you know, even the Gentiles. We tend to move about today in our own circles, as did people then. But Jesus broke every social barrier. For one, he spoke with many women. Now this was really not the proper thing for a rabbi in that culture. And even children. But he also spoke with the wealthy and the powerful. He met with broken people, prostitutes, lepers, demon-possessed, paralyzed. But he also met with civil and religious leaders, even those who despised him, like the Sadducees and the scribes and scholars. He dined with tax collectors and prominent Pharisees, with fishermen and prostitutes. He'd visit a wealthy home, and then he'd sleep rough and the common people loved him. And yet, who was he? Nobody important. He had no rank or title, no status apart from the words that he spoke, the miracles that he did, and the way that people responded to them. The effect they had. All his followers were just ordinary Galileans, fishermen, or others of no account. Now, if we were to try to put Jesus in today's terms, right here in Gloucester, Imagine somebody who collects around him a group of builders or factory workers to follow him. And then he appears on celebrity shows like The Great British Bake Off. And then he spends a week with a group of Afghan refugees. Then he teaches outside the Gloucester Cathedral, including the cathedral congregation. But then he's seen dancing at the Gloucester nightclubs. So the bishop wants nothing to do with him. So he comes to preach at Matson Church. And then he stops at the women's prison, chats with the Gloucester rugby team, and ends up sleeping at a care home before meeting with Richard Graham, the local MP, the next day. It's just odd. People aren't supposed to be like that. Jesus broke every barrier. Now, can you think of one thing that all these meetings with Jesus had in common? No one who encountered Jesus could remain neutral. Jesus changed people. He compelled people to make a choice, to be for him or against him, to love him or hate him, follow him or reject him. It was impossible to meet Jesus and remain neutral. It's like if I have these keys here in my pocket and I'm gonna to toss them to Jonathan. Oh. Good catch, Jonathan, thank you. Now, I forced Jonathan to make a choice. I threw the keys and he had to catch them. Or he, I suppose he could have let them drop or, or maybe jump out of the way if he was quick enough. But he had to make a choice. Jesus did that. He provoked people. He angered people. He offered forgiveness or healing or he did something offensive or asked people to do something radical but he always compelled people to respond. Now let's turn back to our story and the context. Does anyone know when in Jesus' ministry this story takes place? Does it matter? Well, here's where some comparison in the Gospels can be helpful. 
Matthew's gospel moves things around, but Luke's gospel is very carefully chronological. Mark is also chronological, but he jumps over lots of bits and, and just focuses on the, on the really interesting stories and miracles. So according to Luke and Mark, this story is the last event before Jesus starts his last journey to Jerusalem, the Passion Week, the final week of his life. He's in Perea, on the far side of the Jordan. And immediately after this story, we find him in, in Jericho, heading up to Passover on his way to the cross. So this, we're at the very end of Jesus' ministry. He's already well known. He has a kind of celebrity status amongst common people. And the authorities are already seeking ways to arrest him. That's the background context. Jesus has been teaching and preaching up and down the land. And what has been the main theme of all his teaching? The kingdom of God. He's been announcing the kingdom of God, telling parables about the kingdom of God, explaining about the kingdom of God. So it's well worth noting the literary context of this story. What comes before this story in the Bible? It's the children flocking to Jesus. And Jesus says, don't hinder them. Uh, let the little children come. I tell you the truth. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Well, we might ask, how does a little child come into the kingdom of God? And the answer is, with nothing. A child comes unencumbered with duties or responsibilities, with wealth or status. They come with nothing but complete openness and trust. They hold nothing back. Now, what happens immediately after our story? Jesus tells a parable about the kingdom, explaining that in the kingdom of God, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. We don't have time to explore that now, but it's directly related to his encounter with the rich young ruler. So our story is not just random, it's sandwiched between two critical teachings about the kingdom of God. And it takes place at the very end of Jesus' ministry, just as he's about to head for Jerusalem and go to the cross. So now to our story. Matthew simply says, a man came up to Jesus. Luke tells us this was not just any man. A certain ruler asks Jesus. But Mark knows how to tell a story. He writes, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. <laughs> wow, now that puts a different angle on things. First of all, it was completely and utterly culturally unacceptable for a first century Middle Eastern Jewish man of high status to run. You would not see that. That little detail that we so easily pass over may have been the most extraordinary aspect to Mark's original readers. What was so dreadfully important to this man that he had to run? And secondly, to kneel down. This man is, is a man of wealth and status, a local ruler. Now, this only begins to make sense when Matthew's Gospel tells us he was a young man. We might speculate then that, that he has inherited his wealth and his position, probably lands, farms, horses, livestock, and like all young men, perhaps he feels a bit trapped in his life. And he's heard about the amazing things Jesus is doing and his teaching, and he hears that Jesus is traveling nearby. So he's a bit impetuous, and, he, and this may be his only opportunity to see Jesus and to ask him the question that's been burning at his heart. So he runs to catch up to Jesus, and then perhaps without even thinking, to show his sincerity and his respect for this rabbi, he kneels down and asks his question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers in a very odd way. Why do you call me good? He says. Now, here we have a strange cultural issue. In the Old Testament and the Judaism of that day, the term good was specifically reserved for God, except when something was derived from God. 
So it could be taken as a deep and sincere tribute that this man was recognizing that Jesus was sent from God. And Jesus responds by redirecting that praise back to his father. This doesn't really make sense in English because we don't use the word good in that specific way. But you might think maybe of the word holy. It would be very unusual for us to call someone holy today. Okay. What about his other question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, here we have an interesting dichotomy. The context of this passage is the kingdom of God. But the man asks about eternal life. Now, I think most of us naturally assume that these concepts are the same thing. Salvation, eternal life, kingdom of God, you know, they're all kind of together. But if we dig deeper, Jesus is actually identifying a change in how we think about these things, about the kingdom of God. And this was directly related to this man's problem. Eternal life for the Jews was an eschatological goal, a future goal. It really meant life in the age to come. And what they believed at that time was that one day a Messiah would come and inaugurate a new age, a future age, an age of resurrection and peace, perfect peace, much like we today think about the new creation. So Jesus simply reminds the young man of his covenant, of the covenant commandments. Now, we might explore why he names these particular commandments, but more importantly is what happens next. The man says, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And I love the next line, and we only see it in Mark's gospel. Jesus looked at him and loved him. It's as though Jesus knew how hard this next part was going to be, and he had compassion on this young man. In Matthew's gospel, the man asks, what do I still lack? Clearly, here was a man trying his best to be faithful and righteous according to the law, and succeeding. Yet somehow he knew there was more. He seemed to know that personal righteousness was, was not enough. Perhaps he even had an inkling that the kingdom of God was something different. After all, he could have easily justified himself and gone home right then, thinking, great, Jesus has confirmed that I'm righteous. All is well. But Jesus knew he was looking for something more. And in fact, Jesus was calling people to something more. So he said, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. But the man knew he couldn't do that. And so with great sadness, he turned back. You see, the kingdom of God is not just about gaining eternal life. It's about living out that eternal life now. It's a life of discipleship, of following Jesus. And the way to enter that kingdom was not to do something, as the man had asked, but to give up something. In fact, to give up everything. Remove every barrier, every obstacle that might prevent you from following Jesus. It was a path of complete trust. And that's why Jesus said, to enter the kingdom, you come as children. Come with nothing but trust. Now the problem is, every one of us has barriers to following Jesus. For some, it's sin, shame, brokenness, lack of faith. Those are easy. We want them removed. And Jesus offers healing and restoration. But there are other barriers, like wealth, success, comfort, security. And these are much more difficult because we want to keep them. We want to hold on to those things. We worked hard for those things. We put our trust in them. If it's something we've grown to love or hold on to, Jesus demands that we lay it aside and put him first. Otherwise, it's a form of idolatry. And Jesus said, a man cannot serve two masters. Going all the way back to Abraham, 
the father of the Jewish faith, he was asked to give up his son Isaac. And Isaac represented all of God's promises, his entire future. Now, did God want him to kill Isaac? No. God wanted Abraham to place his total trust in God, not in Isaac. Did Jesus want this man to be poor? No. On the contrary, he said, give up your wealth and you'll gain treasure far better. He wanted this man to place his entire trust in Jesus, to be able to leave everything else behind to follow him. But it was too much. Clearly, this young man felt the heavy weight of responsibilities and family expectations, perhaps his status and future security, and it was too much. That's why Jesus said it's so difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Now, wealth is not the only barrier, but it's a particularly difficult one to let go of. So the disciples said to him, Lord, we have left everything to follow you. And Jesus said, No one has left home or family or children or fields to follow me will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in the age to come. But many who are first will be last and the last first. In other words, those with little or nothing to lose can enter easily. But those who have much may take a long time. So let me demonstrate again with these keys. If I said to you, these are the keys of the kingdom, and Jonathan says, well, throw me these keys, or if you say, throw me these keys, and if you've got nothing in your hands, you can catch them. But if you're already holding on to things, you might be able to drop what you're holding and catch the keys, maybe. But imagine now that you are carrying a big box of all of your possessions, all your money, all your important things in your life, and this box is very important to you. And you say, give me the keys to the kingdom. And I throw you the keys. Well, you can't catch them because your hands are full. That's what Jesus meant. This is a hard teaching. Every one of us has barriers to entering the kingdom of God and even after entering, we continue, th these barriers continue to emerge in our lives. And we need to keep on checking our hearts and our attitudes. We don't just encounter Jesus once in our life, but that encounter begins a lifelong relationship. So the question is, are we holding lightly to the things of this world and holding tightly to Christ? That's the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this difficult yet amazing teaching. And we pray that you would help each of us to know in our own lives uh, what things we may need to uh, let loose of in order to follow you more fully and trust you more completely. So, Lord, help us to understand your, your presence in our lives and what those demands are so that we can trust you fully and follow you and work in your kingdom as, as people of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dan. Tremendous challenge there for us all. Uh, the, the hymn which... Uh, uh, we're now going to sing together, Be Thou My Vision, sort of um, asked that that might actually happen, you know, Be Thou My Vision. One of the verses says, Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise, Thou my inheritance, now and always. Um, that's just uh, the same message, isn't it, in a way? Um, thank you again. Uh, song then, Be Thou My Vision, we'll sing... Uh, stand to sing this. Oh, love. 
Thank you, Lord, for bringing Dan to us today and for his explanation of your word so clearly to us. Lord, it brings me two songs, the one of which we sung recently, Jesus be the centre. And that's what we pray, Lord. And if we do that, another one which you sung a bit further away, we're coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are worthy of magnificent and powerful. It's hard sometimes to to remember when we see the the world that's around us and what's wrong with it. But we know because of you, your spirit in us, that you know that you have the plan for us in the long run. Lord, we pray 
for people in our community and let's in our hearts gradually talk, think and bring to God people who come to mind. We pray for, first of all, people we know in hospital. May they receive the, 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 the care and attention that they need so badly. And Lord, too, we think of those who are in, in care homes that we know and love. May they feel safe and secure in their relationships. We pray, too, for those who are com com convalescing or hoping to be just get better, Lord. And for those who, are, who have COVID or are in fear of coming out still, they're not, not, not confident enough, Lord. Be with them and trust. we trust that you will support them and comfort them. And Lord, looking at the bigger, wider world, there's so much just that, that need, needs prayer. And we thank you that you have it in mind. But we come to mind, especially Ukraine this week, Oh Lord, it could be any day that that, uh, that country comes to a, a place of such such devastation. Lord, will you please quieten the hearts of those people and give wisdom to the, the leaders that they don't take such a stupid step and bring death and misery to so many people. Lord, we thank you too for our, our brothers and sisters around the world who are, some of them who travel, are having such a difficult time because, because of their faith, they're, they're being shunned by their communities and being stopped of having, having care and having food and water. Lord, be with them and let, let them know that we are we're with them when they suffer, we, we suffer too, Lord. Thank you for that. And thank you that you will bring them to glory one day. Thank you for that, Lord. So we bring these prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've got some notices from Margaret. She's not very well, but she's getting better. And she should be here next Sunday to lead us and um, take us through communion. Um, so this week, the usual things are happening. Um, Renew One is on Friday from 10 to 12. And a special announcement from Margaret about the Easter eggs. Um, the plan is that the church will give um, an Easter egg and a booklet about the meaning of Easter to the children. Now, they're not children who necessarily come here, but they come during the week to mums and toddlers and the food drop. So the plan is that we will provide um, eggs and also the booklet, which is very important. If you'd like to be involved in that, um, then please give some money to Margaret in the next two weeks. Uh, before the 27th of February um, because we, we all need to just cover the cost of doing that. Do you know how much it will be roughly? I think it's £4.50 for each one. Now I don't know how many I don't know how many mums come on a Tuesday. Does anybody know? No, the, the, the people are not here. S sorry? About 12. 12, 12 mums who come and um, the people who come for, to th for the food drop. Yeah, so that's something to think about. We've got two weeks uh, to bring some money and give it to Margaret, perhaps next week or the week after. No, no. Okay, so I think that's most things. We've got a deacons meeting planned for this Wednesday. But some of the deacons are not well. We may have to shift it to n uh, next week. But I think they're all gradually getting better. Thank you.
Marion is wanting to say that there is no tea and coffee again after the um, service today because of the COVID. Um, still hanging around. Um, we've had it very badly in the church, as you all know. And thankfully, most people are recovering now, but still testing positive. So um, we need to pray about that. I'm sure you all do. Um, I just wanted to speak about the World Day of Prayer, which will be on Friday the 4th of March. It's come creeping up on us very quickly now. And um, Alan actually just quoted the title, I Know the Plans I Have for You. don't know whether you noticed him in his prayers quoting that. And that is the title. And it, the service this year has been written by um, people of Great Britain, uh, ladies of Great Britain, and it is England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Scotland has their own. Um, they started up as part of the uh, World Day of Prayer, or it was then the Women's World Day of Prayer, uh, before the rest of Great Britain. Um, if the ladies that I have approached wouldn't mind coming to me rather than me trying to chase them as they go out of the door I can supply you with your books um, the only one I haven't spoken to I can see let me see I can see Irene is here and Brenda and Kath and Marion and Shirley um, and Sylvia uh, the only one I haven't spoken to personally is Phyllis so um, if uh, you would if you'd like to come and um, We'll, we'll meet as people leave. We'll find a space. There's a space at the back there that is empty. Thank you. Sorry to Thanks have put it in. Charlie, you had a question. Um, oh, yes, I saw one of the sheets about conversational English. What's that? Margaret saw a need from um, stemming really from the people that we do the food distribution to on Tuesdays and Saturdays, many of whom English is not their first language. So uh, Margaret has set up this meeting on Thursday mornings for an hour of conversational English. 9.30 to 10.30 on a Thursday. I think she's just doing it on her own because I'm actually looking into doing TEFL qualification um, maybe to assist. Well, maybe but not, early, so well. Ring Margaret first. Ring Margaret first because I think at the moment it's an all-women group and there oh, are, will be issues. I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying culturally, have a word with Margaret first. Good. Uh, um, we're going to sing one last hymn. We've got just uh, time for that. Uh, it's a sort of hymn of commitment. O thou who camest from above, uh, kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart, there may it to thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze. Um, Professor Bruce used to say that you could tell that Charles Wesley was a great hymn writer because he could get the word inextinguishable <laughs> into a hymn. Um, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, uh, let's sing it together and then we'll have the benediction after that.
let's, uh, let's say the grace to each other, shall we? Um, uh, turn and greet people at the same time, so to speak. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you.